balance one three-part series against another, or construct a three-part series of balanced forms, and the sentence can become a pinball machine of sounds, rhythms, images, and ideas, twos bouncing off of threes, threes combining balances, balances containing serial constructions, and so on. I can't think of any modern writer who does a better job of constructing verbal pinball machines than William Gass. Gass is the David May Distinguished University Professor Emeritus in the Humanities at Washington University in St. Louis, where for many years he taught philosophy and English. More important, he is one of America's most celebrated writers and critics, and among prose stylists who have thought long and hard about prose, he has no equal. Just a few of his works that have shaped my understanding of language, writing, and the glories of the sentence are Fiction and the Figures of Life, On Being Blue, A Philosophical Inquiry, The World Within the Word, Finding a Form, and A Temple of Texts. Among several other honors, his collections of essays have twice won National Book Critics Circle Awards, and he was the first winner of the Penn Nabokov Award, quote, for celebrating the accomplishments of an author whose body of work represents achievement in a variety of literary genres and is of enduring originality and consummate craftsmanship, end of quote. His novels are Omen Setter's Luck, Willie Masters' Lonesome Wife, and The Tunnel, and he's published two collections of short stories, in the heart of the heart of the country and other stories in Cartesian Sonata. If you have never read William Gass, it's high time you start, and you're in for nothing less than a take the top off your head treat. If you have read Gass, revisit him. The treat is still there. There is no other writer in America who combines Gass's stylistic verve and panache with his philosophical rigor nor is there any writer in America who has devoted more serious thought to language, to writing, and most important for our purposes, to the sentence. Gass has famously claimed that, quote, Gertrude Stein did more with sentences and understood them better than any writer ever has, end of quote. But this is one of the only areas I can think of where William Gass is flat out wrong since his contemplation of the sentence builds on and easily surpasses Stein's. Indeed, his essay, The Ontology of the Sentence, or How to Make a World of Words, is the most wise and the most useful contemplation of the sentence that we have. Here's a sample of Gass as he's just getting warmed up to his subject in an essay on the music of prose. For prose has a pace. It is dotted with stops and pauses, frequent rests, inflections rise and fall like a low range of hills. Certain tones are prolonged. There are patterns of stress and harmonious measures. There is a proper method of pronunciation, even if it is rarely observed. Alliteration will trouble the tongue. Consonants ease its sounds out so that any mouth making that music will feel its performance even to the back of the teeth and to the glottal stop. Mellifluousness is not impossible and harshness is easy. Drum roll and clangor can be confidently called for, lisp, slur, and growl. So there will be a syllabic beat and imitation of the heart, while rhyme will recall a word we passed perhaps too indifferently. Vowels will open and consonants close like blooming plants, Repetitive schemes will act as refrains, and there will be phrases, little motifs to return to, like the tonic. Clauses will be balanced by other clauses, the way a waiter carries trays. Parallel lines will nevertheless meet in their common subject. Clots of concepts will dissolve and then recombine, so we shall find endless variations on the same theme, a central idea, along with its many modifications like soloist and chorus, will take their turns until suddenly all sing at once the same sound. Of course, that's one marvelous single sentence. And here's Gass's exultant reminder from On Being Blue that sentences 
do things, they are alive, are closely tied to the body's basic rhythms, and when in the hands of a masterful writer can be taught steps that dance across the lips and across the page. So, sentences are copied, constructed, or created. They are uttered, mentioned, or used. Each says, means, implies, reveals, connects. Each titillates, invites, conceals, suggests, and each is eventually either consumed or conserved. Nevertheless, the lines in Stevens are the sentences of Joyce and James pressed by one another into being as though the words before and the words after were those reverent hands both Rilke and Rodin have celebrated, clay calling to clay like mating birds, concept responding to concept the way passionate flesh congests every note, a nipple on the breast, at once a triumphant pinnacle and perfect conclusion like pelted water, I think I said, yet at the same time only another anonymous cell and selfless in its service to the shaping skin as lost forgotten matter is in all walls. These lines, these sentences are not quite uttered, not quite mentioned, peculiarly employed, strangely listed, oddly used, as though a shadow were the leaves, limbs, trunk of a new tree, and the shade itself were thrust like a dark torch into the grassy air in the same slow and forceful way as its own roots, entering the earth, roughen the darkness there, till all its freshly shattered facets shine against themselves as teeth do in the clenched jaw. For Rabelais was wrong. Blue is the color of the mind in borrow of the body. It is the color consciousness becomes when caressed. It is the dark inside of sentences. Sentences which follow their own turnings inward, out of sight, like the whirls of a shell, and which we follow warily as Alice after that rabbit, nervous and white till suddenly there, climbing down clauses and passing through A-N-D as it opens, there, there, we're here in time for tea and tantrums. Such are the sentences we should like to love, the ones which love us and themselves as well, incestuous sentences, sentences which make an imaginary speaker speak the imagination loudly to the reading eye that have a kind of orality transmogrified, not the tongue touching the genital tip, but the idea of the tongue, the thought of the tongue, word wet to part wet, public mouth to private, seed to speech, and speech, ah, after exclamations, groans, with order gone, disorder on the way, we subside through sentences like these, the risk of senselessness like this, to float like leaves on the restful surface of that world of words to come, and there, in peace, patiently to dream of the sensuous, imagined, and mindful sublime. Whew. <laughs> That's the most exciting and the most excited sentence I know of. It's counterpointed rhythms, rhymes, and alliterations rising to a climax that is sensual, if not sexual. It's very being, a refutation to the prose prudes who claim that overly designed and structured sentences are artificial and unnatural. It's orgasmic progression, a celebration of language that lives, that is as organic and natural as nature itself. And for the moment, that's the last contemporary example, at least from William Gass, that I'll offer to suggest the uncharted power a writer can tap when combining duple and triple rhythms, the sounds and sense of two and three part serials. But I wanted you to experience the unpredictable energies of Gass's prose before offering more traditional and less lively examples. In the last lecture, I gave a brief overview of the attempt by Winston Weathers to theorize the rhetorical affect and impact of two and three part serial constructions. You'll remember that, in a nutshell, Weathers suggested that the two part series, which we've been calling balance or balanced form, has connotations of authority and expertise, if not of authoritarianism. In contrast, the three part series, according to Weathers, has connotations of the reasonable, the believable, and even the logical. I did not mention what Weathers had to say about serial constructions of four or more parts, which he saw as suggesting 
the human, emotional, diffuse, and inexplicable, because while these longer constructions clearly invoke the affective power of parallelism, I'm not sure readers can really process in any meaningful way four or more sound patterns or conceptual units without simply thinking of them as a list. A test example might be James Baldwin's sentences, uh, sentence from Notes of a Native Son, in which he describes the aftermath of throwing a glass at a waitress in an all-white restaurant. And with that sound, my frozen blood abruptly thawed. I returned from wherever I had been. I saw for the first time the restaurant, the people with their mouths open already, as it seemed to me, rising as one man. And I realized what I had done and where I was, and I was frightened. And the samples I just read from William Guess may also, in their extended serials that seem to inventory reality, evoke an impression of the human, emotional, diffuse, and inexplicable impact of the uh, four or more part series. However, as Weathers suggests with his own prose, which both employs the authority of balance to discuss the reasonability of the three part series, and the reasonability of the three-part series to bolster his account of balance, the ties among kinds of serial constructions are quite complex. Weathers published his Rhetoric of the Series essay in College Composition and Communication in 1966, offering it as a prolegomenon to the rigorous study of serial constructions. While this essay has been subsequently reprinted in stylistic studies such as Glenn Love's and Michael Payne's important contemporary essays on style, rhetoric, linguistics, and criticism, and you have to be fond of an anthology you can refer to as the Love and Pain Anthology, I'm not aware of any critical efforts to accept the challenge of the Weathers prolegomenon and to extend his study of the series. That's a shame. It's a shame because I think two- and three-beat constructions may reveal something quite important about the relationship between our writing syntax and our understanding of the world. And even if I'm wrong about that, it's a shame because the interplay of two- and three-part beats and constructions in writing is so prominent that no serious writer can afford not to give these patterns some serious thought. Before we consider the possible sources and implications of the patterns of balance in three-part serial constructions, however, let's get a better structured sense of how these rhythms can be put together and to what effect. We can find numerous examples of the interplay of two- and three-beat rhythms in the lush style associated with Lilly and other euphuistic writers of the 16th century, such as Robert Greene, whose prose in the following passage suggests that use of balance and serial form can indeed reach a point of diminishing returns. But let their love be never so slight and their fancy never so fickle, yet they will be counted as constant if vows may cloak their vanity or tears be taken for truth, if prayers, protestations, and pilgrimages might be performances of promises then the maid should have mountains that hath but molehills, treasure that hath but trash, faith that hath but flattery, truth that hath but trifles. Yea, she should enjoy a trusty lover that is glad of a trothless lecher. But the curt or pointed style of Francis Bacon, so well known for its three-part serials, also contains a striking number of balances, as we've seen in the selections from his Of Studies where the drum-like beat of three-part serial constructions is counterpointed and possibly foregrounded even more by balances between Bacon's opening claim that studies serve for delight, for ornament, and for ability, and his summing up that readeth making a full man, reading maketh a full man, conference a ready man, and writing an exact man, we find expert men balanced against those that are learned the chiasmic claim that studies perfect nature and are perfected by experience, and two-beat pairs such as execute and perhaps judge, without them and above them, contradict and confute, believe and take for granted, weigh and consider and chewed and digested. On the other hand, 
the fabled balances of Dr. Johnson, and as we shall soon see of Macaulay, regularly employ three-part serials. While my own examples of the interplay of balance and series are relatively crude, they illustrate the basic options for balancing one series against another. Here are the basic patterns. Bruised, bleeding, and exhausted, the boxer stumbled back to his corner at the end of the fifth round, desperately in need of attention to the cut over his left eye, desperately in need of the encouragement of his trainer, and desperately in need of the unlikely arrival of a miracle. Here's another one, a way of creating three-part serials from balances. As excited as I was nervous, as hopeful as I was hapless, as thankful for the opportunity as I was aware of the odds against me, I walked into the interview. And here's a way of just weaving together balance and series without a clear, uh, without a clear uh, blueprint for what we're doing. The more imaginative and inspired the instructor, the more inspiring and effective will be her instruction, the longer lasting her impact and the more grateful her students. Or a pattern even for playing with more complicated schemes such as polypteton, the use of a second word derived from the same root as the first. A walking, talking caricature of the inept politician, the silver-haired and silky-voiced senator was a functionary whose legislative proposals were rarely functional, a would-be backroom operator whose attempts at being effective usually turned out to be spectacularly ineffectual, a cut-rate visionary whose initiatives consistently failed to initiate significant change. We've seen how gas weaves these rhythms together in patterns that are unexpected, but we should remember that they have much more frequently been combined in patterns that were almost diagrammatic. Macaulay denounced Dr. Johnson for the artificiality of his over-designed prose, but Macaulay is himself regarded as a master of balanced form, and his balances frequently employ, or are employed by, three-part serial constructions. Consider these examples from his literary criticism, which was itself balanced between critiquing books about prominent historical and literary figures and reassessments of those figures themselves, and in many cases drew the further distinction between the writing and the personal lives of those figures. Here's Macaulay on Machiavelli. The terms in which he is commonly described would seem to import that he was the tempter, the evil principle, the discoverer of ambition and revenge, the original inventor of perjury, and that before the publication of his fatal prints, there had never been a hypocrite, a tyrant, or a traitor, a simulated virtue, or a convenient crime. Another take on Machiavelli. The whole man seems to be an enigma, a grotesque assemblage of incongruous qualities, selfishness and generosity, cruelty and benevolence, craft and simplicity, abject villainy and romantic heroism. Here's an excerpt from Macaulay's review of Boswell's Life of Johnson. First of all, he didn't much like the edition. He said, this edition is ill-compiled, ill-arranged, ill-written, and ill-printed. Here's his comments on Boswell. All the caprices of his, Boswell's temper, all the illusions of his vanity, all his hypochondriac whimsies, all his castles in the air, he displayed with a cool self-complacency, a perfect unconsciousness that he was making a fool of himself to which it is impossible to find a parallel in the whole history of mankind. He has used many people ill, but assuredly he has used nobody so ill as himself. And another knock. He had indeed a quick observation and a retentive memory. These qualities, if he had been a man of sense and virtue, would scarcely have sufficed to make him conspicuous, but because he was a dunce, a parasite, and a coxcomb, they have made him immortal. Here's Macaulay's take on Bacon. His faults were, we write it with pain, coldness of heart and meanness of spirit. He seems to have been incapable of feeling strong affection, of facing great dangers, of making great sacrifices. 
The difference between Gass and Macaulay is much greater than the difference between a carefully controlled manipulation of prose rhythms and an exuberant gush. It is the difference between what we might call a classical view of rhetoric and what we might call a postmodern view. Macaulay, much like rhetoricians for a couple of thousand years before him, saw his control of tropes and schemes, syntax and other structures as a supporting adjunct to his arguments, moves that clarified and emphasized the propositional and logical content of his claims. Gass also presents his celebrations of sound and syntax in support of claims about the subject matter of his sentences. But for Gass, as for Gertrude Stein before him, his sentences themselves are always part of the point of his writing, if not the main point. In keeping with his place in the forefront of postmodern writers, Gass always sees language as a subject, every bit as interesting and as important as is the referential world his language points to, invokes, or stands for. For Gass, the instance of his discourse is always center stage, his writing always about writing, just as surely as it is about the people, the prose, or whatever phenomena it seems to put forward as his subjects. As I previously noted, Postmodernism would itself be the subject of a lecture series in its own right, so I mention this aspect of Gass's prose here only to suggest that his use of sound and syntax, even when it seems to parallel or echo that of classical rhetoricians such as Macaulay, is significantly different. And we write in the context of that difference, whether or not it concerns us in the propositional sense, it concerns Gass. Like it or not, our writing, our prose style, takes its place in a world that has been reconfigured by the aesthetics and assumptions of postmodernism, just as surely as postmodernism has been configured and constituted by the progress of technology, particularly media technology. In this and previous lectures, We've now seen numerous examples of balanced three-part serials and ways in which these two basic rhythms can be made to work together, each intensifying the other. Now it's time to consider for a few moments just why these rhythms are so prominent in English prose. I have previously discussed prefab phatic phrases such as after all or in a way or of course that act as syntactic speed bumps in sentences slowing them down and drawing them out. Now, I want to mention a very different kind of phatic prefab construction that, if anything, may serve to speed a sentence up. Moreover, these prefab phrases so intensely invoke balanced rhythm that they accentuate any other balances that may have been constructed within or between sentences. I'm thinking of an amazing number of phrases that remind us just how prevalent balanced rhythm is in our speech and in our writing. Just a small sample of these phrases would include namby-pamby, helter-skelter, wishy-washy, flip-flop, moldy-oldy, flim-flam, meet and greet, hip-hop, town and gown, surf and turf, herky-jerky, topsy-turvy, hurly-burly, razzle-dazzle, itsy-bitsy, teeny-weeny, and I bet you thought I was going to say yellow polka dot bikini in there. Hotsy totsy, doom and gloom, wear and tear, rough and tough, tit for tat, thrills and chills, rough and tumble, rough and ready, lean and mean, wild and woolly, ticky tacky, shilly shally, bump and grind, ebb and flow, rise and fall, boom and bust, near and dear, whipper, snapper, harem, scarum, slippy, slidey. Splish splash, super duper, eager beaver, super saver, pooper scooper, fixer upper, daily double, hour of power, oopsie daisy, wheeler dealer, rinky dink, dipsy doodle, whew, and to represent the end of the alphabet, zigzag. Believe me, I could go on and on. We have a million zillion of these prefab mini balances. And once you start thinking of them, it's hard to stop. Now, these mini balances can themselves be used to create the collision of two and three beat rhythms we've been looking at and listening to in this lecture, as in the sentence, 
Tall and tan, lean and mean, rested and ready, the mercenaries restlessly awaited their next mission, fit and itching for a fight, feared for their ferocity, armored by their amorality. <sighs> but such a sentence has a certain unfortunate, dare I say it, sing-song quality. My purpose in calling attention to these phrases, apart from the fact that they are really fun to read aloud, is to suggest, as they do, that balance is no artificially constructed or carefully architected rhetorical phenomenon, but that balance speaks to something far more basic and vigorous in our lives. Binary oppositions, such as up, down, in, out, good, bad, day, night, hot, cold, happy, sad, young, old, rich, poor, sweet, salty, regularly divide the world of our experience into twos. And we build from these basic binaries ever larger balanced explanations of the way things are. It's not the heat, it's the humidity. What goes around comes around. What's sauce for the goose is sauce for the gander, until we find ourselves more and more assenting to philosophies reduced to balanced forms. If you can't walk the walk, don't talk the talk. No taxation without representation. Indeed, it seems likely to me that our binging on balance has a visceral antecedent in the bilateral symmetry of our bodies, the inhalation and exhalation of our life breath, the lub-dub rhythm of the human heart, connotations of certainty and authority, you bet, because balance has to do with the very rhythms that keep us going. Then what of the power of three? How do we account for the almost irresistible impulse to make our tales about not one, not two, but three little pigs, three blind mice, why must the genie grant us three wishes? Must the argument rest on three contentions? Why do we get three strikes before we're out? Against binaries such as past and present, the three-part series reminds us to expand our view to consider the future. When we consider the age-old dichotomy of mind and body, the three-part serial reminds us to add soul and so on. A syllogism consists of three parts, major premise, minor premise, and conclusion. And for the rhetorician, the three appeals are to pathos, ethos, and logos. The color wheel suggests that all colors come from the basic trio of red, yellow, and blue. Matter divides into solid, liquid, and gas. Indeed, that basic building block of matter, the atom, is made up of electron, neutron, and proton. Three dimensions, a calendar divided into days, months, and years, a school system divided into elementary, middle, and high schools, our food divided into carbohydrates, proteins, and fats. All these are the three-part constructions we have chosen to make sense of our world. So is the appeal of three-part serial constructions really very much of a mystery? My point is simply that these artificial rhythms of rhetoric the balance of duple rhythm and the three-beat form of serial construction are not artificial at all, but merely extend the central organizing constructs of human consciousness into language. Whitman knew what he was talking about when he claimed of his poetry that it was singing the body electric, and we should do no less in our prose. I think William Guess is on to something very important in his wild celebrations of balance in serials and of all the other rhetorical schemes and tropes he can stuff in the suitcase of his writing, sometime needing to sit on that overstuffed bag to snap it closed, but always traveling with everything he needs. Of all the wisdom I find in Guess's electric prose, what impresses me most is that his syntactical showing off the unexpected metaphors and sometimes silly similes, the obvious attention he lavishes on every word, all always remind us that words matter, that sentences matter, that there is nothing artificial and artifice. As he observes in his essay, Gertrude Stein and the Geography of the Sentence, words are therefore weapons, like the jaws of the crocodile or the claws of the cat, 
We use them to hold our thought as we hold a bone. We use them to communicate with the pack, dupe our enemies, manipulate our friends. We use them to club the living into food.